It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim is actor Doug Jones that played in many films like Hellboy and including Hocus Pocus. What's up? Hey, wow. You dug deep for the Hocus Pocus one. That's 1993, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hocus Pocus, and in case you're wondering who he was, he was a zombie. I was Billy the, Billy the Bill, Dead guy, Billy yeah. Butcherson. I yeah. had so much fun with that. The one that gets po- He was the guy that got poisoned by one of the witches. If you can guess which one, you just might get a treat. <laughs> I can tell you now. Yeah, it's Bette Midler. Yeah, she was wicked to me, and she poisoned me, sewed my mouth shut, and buried me. And then I came back 300 years later to help the kids battle her off. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, what a fun little classic Halloween film that's become over the years. That's, that's always been a fun film. You don't ever get tired of that film, really. So what do you have going on right now? Well, right now... Uh, the next thing coming out for me is July 27th. Uh, that'll be The Watch with Ben Stiller, Vince Vaughn, Jonah Hill, and myself playing the alien that is invading their neighborhood. Mm. Is it starting out as an independent, or is this pretty much going full worldwide? Oh, no, this is going to be this is a huge film. Uh, 20th Century Fox uh, produced it, uh, distributing it. Uh, it'll be opening uh, nationwide on, on the 27th of July. And... Um, with big stars like that in it, yeah, it should, it should have a pretty good opening weekend, we're, we're guessing. And, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, Vince Vaughn, Jonah Hill, uh, and uh, uh, Ben Stiller, and the, the fourth character, Richard Iowata, the, he's from the IT crowd, funny, funny guy with nerdy glasses. Uh, the four of them have formed a neighborhood crime watch in their neighborhood. And uh, there's not a whole bunch to do, there's not much crime, so there's no, they just kind of like, you know, having a boys club, so they end up in Vince Vaughn's garage a lot, playing pool, uh, listening to music, drinking beer, telling fart jokes, the whole thing. Until the alien invasion starts happening and, and weird things start happening in the neighborhood and they find themselves way in over their heads and nobody believes them of, about what's going on so the local cops aren't even helping. And um, so uh, they take it upon themselves to you know save the world from the, the, the destruction that is about to befall it. So I'm the lead alien guy and um, I bring all my minions with me, so you'll see you'll see all that happening. And it's a it's it's very fun. It's a very funny movie. Those with those four guys, especially, you know, it's a funny script anyway. But once they get to bantering back and forth, and the scene takes a whole new form in life when they they go off the page and start improving and vamping on their own. It, it was hilarious to work on. And um, uh, so they, they those guys bring the funny, and I bring the scary. I'm like the sci-fi part of the movie. So it's kind of like a, a comedy sci-fi in the same vein that. Um, Ghostbusters was. Is this kind of a, a little bit of a risk for you? I mean, there, there are a lot of sci-fi films out there, but some of them do very well, and some of them just go completely bombed. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, it all it all depends. Yeah. I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't feel risky at all. No. But, you know, when it's a comedy, all bets are off. You know, I, I feel that, like, uh, if, if we're doing something just for the funny, um, you know, then liberties can be taken, and, and fans are more forgiving if it's done for funny. Yeah, but if you're making, you know, if you're making a Prometheus or something like that, you've got to be spot on and you've got to be very dedicated to your fan base there, you know? Yeah, uh, considering how many characters you played as over the years. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, you definitely got to get it on. But you're also in an uh, upcoming horror film, uh, John Dies at the End. Yes, what a fun one that is. Uh, directed by, and, and the screenplay was written by Don Coscarelli and directed by Don Coscarelli. He, um, he took this... A book called John Dies at the End and adapted it for film. It is uh, it's quirky, funny, disturbingly dark. Uh, yeah, it's been playing very well at uh, Sundance Film Festival, the South by Southwest Film Festival, packed houses, and the reviews have come in. And the reviewers keep saying uh, things like, "I'm not sure I understood it all, but I loved it." <laughs> so uh, it's one of those. It's a quirky film with a, a whole you know setup. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, uh, there's two dimensions going on at the same time, and, and there's two worlds happening at the same time. And these two kids in in our world here, uh, uh, they they're taking a drug called soy sauce. It's like a recreational on the off the street drug. Uh, and when they take this soy sauce, they they start hallucinating. But it turns out that the the, the soy sauce chooses who it will, will reveal the other dimension to in real life, basically. So um, somehow these two kids are seeing things and seeing what's happening in this other dimension that, that that's actually going on uh, and I am a character named Roger North who comes from this other dimension and I'm once this portal's been opened up by the soy sauce I'm watching these kids and I'm think and uh, I visit them uh, and I, I manifest myself in the backseat of their car and that's the first time you see me in the movie and I I 
I kind of help explain what's happening and that they, the world's in great peril and they're going to need to f- save it because they're the ones who are, who are in the know now. They're the ones who can cross over and fix things in our dimension to fix things in their dimension. So that is, if you're if you're confused now, just wait till you see the movie. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's going to get only going to get worse. But um, but it's great tongue in cheek humor and Paul Giamatti's in it with me and Clancy Brown. Uh, you know some great iconic actors and Angus Scrim from Phantasm and uh, uh, and the, the two lead kids are, are a couple of newcomers, Rob Mays and uh, and the lead is actually Chase Williamson and he's just fantastic. These kids are great. Would you say this might be a, a little bit of a breath of fresh air as far as what's going on in the industry right now? Like for this film, you think it's actually going to kind of pop out? I do think so, especially because of Don Coscarelli's thumbprint on the movie since he wrote and directed it. He's the same guy that gave you the, the Phantasm movies and Bubba Hotep, uh, which was a kind of a cult classic. So uh, he's uh, he's gonna ha- he's definitely has his own quirky, funny spin on things, uh, much like a Joss Whedon would, you know. So I think it's def- definitely gonna be a standout. Okay, when's this one coming out? Is this going basically direct to DVD, or is it uh, just being streamed out on online? Uh, it's still it's still uh, playing the film festival circuit. It just had a, um, a packed out, sold out house in Seattle, uh, and uh, so I think once uh, once we get distribution, it's probably going to stop the film festivals. And, and I was told maybe still like in the fall this year, a theatrical run. I don't know. Uh, I, w- I, I would hope so, but it, it all depends on on how much buzz it gets. You know, these these uh, when a line forms around the building at the film festivals to see it, that kind of bodes well that it might actually have a, a, a chance at a theatrical run, even if it's limited, uh, before the DVD comes out, which I would hope for. Yeah, with with, with these type of films, uh, especially independent ones, uh, do you think it's it's actually starting to grow better compared now than before? Indie films? Yeah, I sure do. Uh, there's a lot more of them. That's for dang sure. Especially, I think was with, was when the changeover happened from. Uh, you don't have to shoot on film anymore, and film was so expensive that 35 millimeter stock was yeah. and developing it, and you know, and transferring things. Now you can shoot on digital and uh, with a film quality, so it's accessible to everyone now at any budget level to make a uh, you know a slick looking film if you write it a good script, and yeah. if you get good actors, and if you direct a good film and edit it together properly, you can have a slick look. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think the, the world of indie film has, has come leaps and bounds in in the last few years. Yeah, it's just it's always been there, but the thing is, it's up and downs as far as, as far as popularity. It's like oh, it's like oh, it, it, it's always that whole. Uh, well, it's got to be that one film that stands out than all the other ones. It's like oh, okay, we'll, we'll pick that up. But a lot of independent films, it, they go up and then they go back down, right. off and on every time. Right, it all depends. But yeah, you never know where the magic's going to be, what, what an audience is really going to respond to. But uh, but for me, you know, when, when I pick a project to do an indie film. If it's a story that I want to help tell that amuses me or entertains me or puts me on a thrill ride of some sort uh, or makes me feel something, uh, that's that's step number one. Step number two for me is the character. Uh, how does that character play in this story that I want to help tell? Do I have great dialogue, great relationships? Uh, do I have a, you know an emotional arc to, to travel through, a journey of my own? Uh, that's all enticing to me. And then number three is the director. Whose hands am I going to be in and, and who's going to be cutting this together and, and uh, you know who's the actual storyteller? And that's usually the, the director of the film. So uh, if all three of those things are in place, then, then that, that, that's what will interest me to be in a movie. And, uh, and I don't want to... I don't want to boast or anything, but I've, 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 I've been semi-okay about picking my projects, I think. So hopefully this will be another winner. Oh, yeah. And there's no, absolutely nothing wrong with B-side movies either. Those are really cool, too. Right. If you, if you can laugh your way through some, some cheesy horror, that's great yeah. fun for the whole family, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's just absolutely not. And believe it or not, yeah, of course, a lot of B-side movies that just were specifically B-side end up being called, cla- called classics later on in the future. Right, right, exactly. With the advent of things like, you know, Netflix and Hulu and there's iTunes. There's so many different oh, places yeah. to watch movies now. So the, that's why the business is. Yeah. Speaking of which, since everything's gone to digital, do you think it's actually killing the industry? Or do you actually think it's really helping the industry? Oh, I don't know. I think uh, uh, it's funny because box office receipts are still coming in. So I think that the big theater experience won't go away. You can't you can't match that. You know, when you go into that smell of the popcorn and, and the big surround sound and the huge screens. And oh, certainly. Especially with 3D now, too. Uh, you know, uh, so many films are coming out in 3D. I don't think the theater experience is going to go away anytime soon. 
Oh, never. But I mean, everything's on digital. You can just download it. You can stream it. But and rather than going to the theater and just watching it on the on the big big screen, whichever your pleasure is. But right. Well, that, I think I think we uh, you know people have a, have the theater experience with on the big screen, love it, and then they want to get it on the downloadable version too. You know, they want it in the palm of their hand on their iPhone or wherever, and that's that's great. It's, it only it only helps the whole the whole industry, I think. Sometimes, but the thing is, there's always that piracy as well, and you you really can't control that. Regardless, no matter what technology come out, no matter the biggest you know spam blocker in the world can't help it, no matter what. Yeah, yeah. But it's also taken away from the artist. It would take a, take away from you if they if that if your film right now is being streamed or downloaded right now for free, and someone can just pass out DVDs for free. Right. Well, that's um, you know, that's all copyrighted material. It's like uh, so. There's there's laws in place, but I know people can get around those that, and I you know of course I I'm not in favor of downloadable piracy and all that, but but yeah, if you do it the right way, and it's still to download a movie without it can be cheaper than buying a DVD from from your store. So it's still there. There are many cheaper options. You don't you know I don't. I, uh, you're, you're, the right you're way basically and, and <laughs> everyone still makes a profit and everyone's still happy about it. I think you just pretty much sit on the fence and just watch what happens, right? <laughs> yeah, cause I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not uh, you're not. You're not really for it. You're really, not against you know. it. You're just sitting there, just watching. It's like, well, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Exactly. <laughs> but it, it's always going to be a problem. Um, it's it's a huge thing. Everything's so digital. Everything we got all these all this technology that that can help, but it can also ruin the experience as far as film goes. Now, of course, that goes right back to CGI. It's it's a great tool, but then you see it splashed all over the film. It's it's it makes it that whole fake effect. Right, right. And it's like, well, it's not really as interesting as it was before because, you know, it's especially when someone's cutting someone's limbs off or even even driving a background somewhere, it's like the background looks so fake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rather than going to on, on a real location and then filming it. <laughs> right, I think, yeah, I think, uh, gee, that, that whole discussion, that, that's a whole other discussion, I think, but uh, uh, I think CG, when it's used properly, uh, you know, can marry itself into the filmmaking world really, really usefully. I, I think it, it takes a village. I like, I like visual. I love uh, visual computer effects. I also love practical effects that are done on set and that they film. And that's that's why I come in work. Well, most of the of the the characters that I play, all the creatures that I played, have been makeups and costumes that I've worn on film, as opposed to wearing dots and then, then they draw it in later. You know, I've never done that before. So. Uh, so I really appreciate the artistry that goes into making an actor look like a creature and filming him. And then I, the, the ch- challenge is mine to make that costume or that makeup come to life as that creature, you know. Yeah. Um, that's a whole art form that I, that I don't think will be gone anytime soon either because 100% CG characters, you know, the audiences uh, can spot them you know, still. You know, and then if it doesn't look real enough or they can't connect to the eyes enough or they can't feel the humanity of that character enough, they're not going to. They're not going to connect with them as much. So yeah, some companies they get a little too frustrated with with that portion, and then you know, so basically just say fuck it. Uh, we're going to go with CGI, and then because they don't want to mess with the real element effect, you know, like dressing up in an actual costume and getting all the makeup on there. It, of course, it takes a lot of time putting all that on, but it'll eventually pay off. It does. I believe you're right. So I'm I'm an advocate of. Uh, but, but then there's some characters like like the Silver Surfer that I played, for instance. Yeah. Classic Four sequel where I did wear a costume and a makeup every day. That I looked like the Silver Surfer, but they did uh, Weta Digital, you know, uh, one of the best companies in the world for digital. They 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 brought in uh, you know enhancements for the Silver Surfer. They gave me a coating that made me look really otherworldly and, and helped me fly around the skies, uh, uh, you know, doing stunts that I couldn't do on my own. And you know, they, they, that really was a nice marriage of, of visual and practical effects together. That's a great example of it. Yeah, I mean, it's just something like that. Have you ever thought of doing some stunts yourself? I mean, you seem pretty, you fit the bill. <laughs> um, when it comes to stunts, I I, I don't want to, there are too many good stunt people in this world that are really amazing at what they do that I would never want to call myself a stunt man or, or, or say, yeah, I can do that when, when they're really trained for that. And I'm, I, I like to think of myself as an actor, and I do actually have a tall, skinny sc- stunt double uh, that has done four movies with me now. Um, and uh, and he's he's amazing. His name is Dorian Kinji. In fact, he was my stunt double for The Watch coming out July 27th. So you'll uh, and and the alien characters that we played in the The Watch, very agile, very athletic, very violent, very fighty. You know, uh, so a lot of that requires. 
acquired uh, the expertise that, that my stunt double had, um, I, I came up with the, the posture and the language of, you know, the physical language of these creatures. And my stunt double, Dorian, was the one that could, could actually bust through a wall uh, and not break himself. So, um, it, it, again, it takes a village to make these characters happen. And so I'm, I, uh, I, I defer to the, the bigger stunts to the people who know how to, what they're doing, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a stuntman, it doesn't seem that they're as appreciated as they should be because they're breaking their balls for this actor, and because the actor either they get that actor may get paid a lot of money not to do it, right. or uh, you know they don't want to risk you know either killing or breaking a bone of their star role. Well, one of the things too, I mean, you know, a, a big studio movie has a ton of uh, they have millions and millions of dollars at stake. So if their main star gets hurt in the middle of production, that movie has to stop production and yeah. they can't afford to do yeah, that. So, they can't afford it at all. So insurance issues would come up so they, they're they not going to let, you know, these these major movie stars that say, yeah, I do all my own stunts. Eh, not always. You know, there, there's certain things that the studio would never let them do because, you know, that's too much of a risk. So, uh, yes. But, you know, they, they, they let us play to a point and then if, it could, if, if any kind of danger could happen where we could break in half and, and ruin the movie, they, they would never let us do that. No. Well, speaking of the companies, do you actually prefer the smaller kind, or would you actually rather work with the major one? No, well, that's a good question. Um, I I've done both. I do a lot of both. Um, and the difference is that um, a big studio production, like a you know 20th Century Fox or Disney or you know Paramount, Universal, the big studios, what they have to offer is oodles of money that the indie films don't have, right? Uh, yeah. With that money comes the luxuries of you know all, all the behind the scenes luxuries like you know big trailers and big big menus and big you know uh, lo- lo- lavish snack tables and lunches and and uh, personal assistants and the whole thing um, and a longer shooting schedule they don't have to they don't have to shoot as fast and they can uh, with a longer shooting schedule you have the luxury of getting a scene right before you move on to the next one whereas in an indie indie budget you know they're scraping every dollar they have together to make this movie and so they have to do every day costs a lot of money so they do as few days as they can so you usually do a shorter schedule with a lot more scenes shot per day uh and you kind of leave a scene maybe not sure you got it all but eh, let's hope um that's the drawback but uh, the plus side of of indie filmmaking though is that the freedom that the filmmaker has without a studio head over him saying here's what we need for demographics and here's your product placements and here's your blah 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 here's our target audience blah 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 Uh, they don't have to worry about any of that an indie filmmaker can make the story that he's written and, and he can direct what he wants uh, artistically and keeping it all in, uh, you know, intact. I, well, if they make a good film and it, uh, you know, distributors show up at film festivals looking for that next thing. And the big, distribu- the big studios love you know, finding a, a small indie film that didn't cost much to make that they can buy from a film festival um, from, uh, that they didn't have to put any upfront production money into, right? That film's already made. All they have to do is buy it for a low, a low price and then distribute it and advertise the poop out of it and hopefully they'll make their millions back that way. So, you know, uh, that's a good gig for them. Uh, you know, the, uh, the studio films with the, the bigger budgets, the drawback, uh, the, the plus side is, is the money they have and the, what, that, what that affords us. And the drawback would be the layers of decision makers. You've got producers on all kinds of levels and everyone's got, a, got an opinion and everyone's, you know, and they're all terrified of, of you know, of it's all about money, 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 and how you know who are we going to be offending, and what can we, how do we make this as formulaic and appeasing to the masses as possible? Yeah, and the sad thing is, it's like you can easily be replaced if, as far as uh, certain major companies, you can just easily be replaced because if if they disagree with you, whatever that you're arguing about or debating about, it's like you know what, we'll just ask someone else to write this, or we'll just ask someone else to direct this or act this. <laughs> right. Thanks right. for coming. <laughs> Uh, do you think uh, future superhero films between now and, and future, uh, you think it's actually going to be used more of a product rather than something someone can actually enjoy the experience? Well, I don't know. I uh, I think I really have been enjoying the Marvel movies of late. Uh, Thor, Captain America, Iron Man, and the Avengers this summer has been. I really I actually liked it a lot. Uh, it was commercially successful. Of course, they're going to sell a lot of toys off of that. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. uh, meanwhile, though, it was written and directed by Joss Whedon, uh, who is the creator of the Buffy Vampire series and uh, uh, and the um, and Firefly, Serenity, and Dr. Horrible Sing Along Blah. He's got a lot of street cred with the geeks. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's a nice mix of 
big budget, huge Marvel production mixed with the right storyteller to to get it to the fans that that will appreciate it. So I, I think I don't think we're going to lose the integrity of comic books uh, with the, with the more films that are made if we keep getting people involved that care about them. You know, it could just easily be used as a product. It's like okay, here's this actor and here's this actor, and they're like a big super star film. Right. You know? <laughs> it's like oh, okay, and then and then it becomes less appealing. Right. Well, uh, and I, I under, but I understand if they're you know if they're spending millions and millions of dollars to make the movie, they have to make that money back. And one way to yeah. ensure you make money back is to put a big star in the lead role. Yeah. You kind of you, you kind of do have to do that. I understand why, uh, but you know I, I think if you can mix that that marketing sense with art, as long as the two can can coincide together. Then we'll still have a, a movie that, that'll that'll appease everybody. Oh yeah, I mean, regardless, so far it seems like they're they're doing pretty well with these superhero films. Uh, yeah. It's actually it's good to see that we see our favorite heroes actually in action rather than on a piece of paper. Yeah, wait, well, you no, know, I was in I was actually in Batman Returns, the second one. Yeah, uh, you played as one of the clowns, I believe. I was. I was the thin clown. I was one of Danny DeVito's sidekicks when he he played the penguin. And I he hung out with the Red Triangle Circus Gang, and I was I was one of his clown guys. Did, weren't you one? Um, oh God, which one were you though? Were, weren't you? Um, oh. there, there were several clowns. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, I uh, mean, there was one like where Penguin is making a speech outside, uh, or were you like basically in the in the sewers? I was in the sewers a lot. Yeah, right. Um, when he came back from making his mayor speech for the mayor race, um, he, he he flopped, and the the PA system was you know running a recording of, of something he'd said previously that was all, I'm going to take over Gotham City and like these people can laugh. And by the time he, he, people were booing him and he came back down to the sewer and when he got off of his little duck boat, I was the first one who met him and I said, great speech, Oswald. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, and then I was also the one where we, um, when we went into Gotham City, uh, a few of us circus gang people and we um, found the Batmobile parked uh, and we rewired it so that it would go haywire on uh, on Batman. I was the leader of that little mission, and I put the homing device in the car that, that we could track him. So. Ah uh, yes. Yeah, a little, little. I was in about six different scenes throughout the movie. Had a great time on that. It worked for three months, and that was with you know Michael Keaton and Tim Burton directing. Oh, oh he's so great. Those were the good old days. Yeah, I love that film. Of course, no, all of Batman's completely upgraded with, uh, instead of felt, he got some real armor going on. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a different look with Christopher Nolan directing it now, and uh, a, little, a little darker and a little, uh, it doesn't have as much goofy comic bookiness to it. It has more dark comic book to it, I think. Which yeah, is great, though. It's, there's, you know, I think the old Batman series is great uh, for, you know, there's an audience for all of it, so. Yeah, it's, it's definitely more superhero like. It's got that little. Uh, mis- mystery behind Batman now because he's, he's his, his suit is more upgraded now. It looks actually looks really good. I think you're right. I think you're right. But um, let's. You said you also got a book too. Is that? It's crazy. Yeah, I've got I, uh, a coffee table photo book. Uh, you know, I started as a mime many years ago. You know, those those guys that don't talk and wear a white face and, <laughs> and white gloves and a black beret and they follow you around the park and make make you nauseous. Well, um, <laughs> those I started as a mime back in college. Uh, and um, so that kind of, but the the mime art sort of helped lay the groundwork for the kind of characters I play now. I do a lot of physicality and a lot of a lot of uh, creatures that have to move a certain way, and, and the the mime training really helped my body wake up to the fact that dialogue is not just verbal; it's also you know from head to toe. It's very physical. So uh, this book, um, a, a publishing company in Chicago, Medallion Press, they heard that I started as a mime and wanted to retouch my roots, take me back there to being a mime and make this silly book. Uh, so it's all pictures, uh, the coffee table photo book. <laughs> all these photos in there um, uh, depict, you know, silly sayings like a mime is a terrible thing to waste or a meeting of the mimes or get your mime out of the gutter <laughs> or once upon a mime or uh, I've got a lot of my mime. <laughs> Any meeny mimey mo. I mean, it, it, totally. I, so <laughs> that's why I got to 240 pages is because we couldn't stop coming up with puns. So uh, including uh, the TV and film section that has uh, mimey vice and dirty miming and uh, mimey dearest, the little mer mime. It's, it goes on and on. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and, uh, and we have a, a Michael Jackson section that we call, uh, that's where uh, 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 I, I pose in all of his iconic you know, uh, moonwalk poses, <laughs> leaning to the side from the Smooth Criminal video, the bad cover, the thriller cover. We and I, we reenact all that with me as a mime in the middle of it, and um, uh, uh, and we call that section "Mime a say, 
my masah, my makasa. See, <laughs> so it just, it's ridiculous, and we had so much fun with it. And there's even a 40-page flip book in the middle of it that that shows me transforming from a lump on the ground into a uh, a mime leaning on a wall. So it's a little little flip movie. Uh, <laughs> great fun, great fun. <laughs> and this is available at uh, uh, at your uh, Amazon.com if you're an online shopper. You go to Amazon.com and do a little search for mime very own book is what it's called, Mime Very Own Book, and uh, that's M-I-M-E. Uh, and uh, you can also find it, if you're not an online shopper, you can go to your Barnes & Noble, and if uh, if they don't have it in, uh, in stock, they can order it for you. All right, go ahead and plug in your uh, current films again and uh, any other websites that you'd like to plug in as well. Yeah, well, I'm also currently working on a movie called Raze, R-A-Z-E, and that, that stars Zoe Bell, the action star, uh, who was, you know, from Death Proof as the uh, the girl who was on the hood of the car, and uh, uh, you also know her as, uh, as the, the Uma Thurman stunt double from the Kill Bill movies, and um, you know her as Xena, Princess Warrior stunt double from uh, from Xena uh, all those years, so she's amazing, Zoe Bell's amazing, I worked with her on a little film called Angel of Death a while back, and uh, now she came looking for me, she's producing and starring in the movie called Rays, um, and it's kind of like um, it's like a fight club for women, only they're there against their will. And that's why I come in. I'm the patriarch of this elite society that is kidnapping women, putting them into this prison sort of setting, and making them fight each other to the death. So there's your setup. It's ridiculous. And it really explores how much a woman will go to, how, how, what limits a woman will go to to protect, protect the ones she's, she loves. Um, so all these women are fighting to save the lives of their, of their, of their uh, loved ones back home that we have also under surveillance, and if they don't fight, we'll kill them. So it's a it's a really grisly setup, and the, you know a lot of action, a lot of great fight scenes. Um, and the the woman playing my wife in the movie, it's also like uh, you know also in on this whole weird society of people is Sherilyn Finn, who played Audrey in the old Twin Peaks TV series. She is a classic beauty, an amazing actress. So great to work with her. So. Uh, we're just filming now still. Uh, it's, it's an indie project and that Zoe you know, is putting together with her other producers and, and, and whatnot. It's being directed by Josh Waller. And, uh, and so hopefully, uh, if they already got foreign distribution by uh, uh, a deal done at Cannes Film Festival, the Cannes Film Festival market this year. Uh, they put a, a trailer together, just a quick trailer together to show there, and they, they, they sold some foreign countries on it immediately, just on the premise alone. So... You know, put a bunch of hot chicks, you know, in a ring fighting each other to the death, and you're going to have an audience for that, I think. <laughs> so um, that's what I'm doing right now. And uh, all, you can find me at traveling around the country doing all kinds of comic book conventions and um, uh, and horror fan conventions, sci-fi conventions. I do appearances all the time, and I love those. And so that and whatever projects I'm working on in film and TV are all findable at my official website. And that website address is thedougjonesexperience.com that's thedougjonesexperience.com and once you get there you can see t- uh, buttons on the left side for Facebook and Twitter and all that I love Twitter now on Twitter I'm at actor Doug Jones so uh, you can find me and uh, talking on the web all the time well, there you go Doug Jones Doug Jones that's right <laughs> thank you for having me <laughs>